name is Juanita Lopez and welcome to my studio where I do my costuming and my jewelry making. Right now I'm currently working on costuming for some musicians. I also do costuming for dancers. And so I'm going to be giving you a tour of the different types of dance costumes that I make for Mexican folklorico, which is Mexican folk dancing. And I've been working on that for the past 40 years. I have been doing costuming. And I have recently started costuming for some musicians also. I do costuming for Los Angeles and I do costuming for dancers from out of state. And with the costuming that I do, especially for Mexican folk dancing, I have studied the different regions and I get my designs from the different states of Mexico for the particular dances that we are doing in the dance group that I work with. And so I am able to copy many of the things, some items I have to buy in Mexico, especially the embroidered pieces that I'm not very good at or don't have the time for but I do do my own color combinations. I have the liberty to do and say in the state of Jalisco, their dresses with all the ribbons. I have the opportunity to do my own color combinations, which I love to do. So we have two different types of Veracruz costumes. They have their Veracruz Jarocho, and they have their Veracruz Huasteco. Slightly different music, different type of footwork, different costuming. This particular outfit is their Huasteco area. It's a shorter skirt, it goes mid-calf. This is called a kishkemet. Shorter skirt, kishkemet, little headpiece that goes right here on the crown of the head. And this is hand embroidered by me. So I do get a chance to do some hand work, hand embroidery also. These are made by me for it and the colors and these little tassels also are put on one by one that I was able to do for a conference that my students were going to and we were gonna be studying this, this region and I wanted to make sure that my girls always have the correct costume. Many times I have also gone into the country of Mexico to find ribbons, trims, laces that you can't find here in the United States. So because you make costumes, it's not as easy as some people think, because they think, oh, she just goes downtown and buys, picks up a fabric and some ribbons. And you have to go to one area to find ribbons. You have to go to another area to find laces and trims. You have to go to another area to find the fabric that's gonna be the basis for your dresses. And it takes um, a couple of days and then to decide what combinations you're going to use. So making costuming sounds very easy, but it's very time consuming. And so, but I do enjoy it, I have fun. This is from the state of Jalisco which is probably one of my favorite costumes to make because I love working with the colors. I love the color combinations that I find for my skirts to make them look amazing on stage. It's very important to get the correct colors as far as I'm concerned because of the movement of the skirts. When the girls are working them and you see the way they're gonna twirl, it makes a big difference on the colors and how you put them together.
Every state in Mexico has a different type of dance, different costume, and so you need to make sure that you are using the correct fabric for each individual state. Sometimes you can find a beautiful print, you're using, you're making a costume that has print, but if you use a print that reflects one area of Mexico, say the southern area of Mexico, you cannot use that print if you're doing something from the northern area of Mexico. So it's very important that you find the correct type of fabric and the, the correct weight of the fabric and that reflects the rest of the people for each region. And so it's very important that you choose correctly to make sure that your costumes are authentic looking. One of my, another favorite costume, I have many obviously, um, the China Antigua. It's not a China Poblana. And when they use China, it doesn't mean it's Chinese. It comes from the country of Spain. The Chinacos came over to Mexico and the female counterpart to the Chinaco was the China. So we have China Antiguas, which is another costume. And this is one version of it. And we have many different versions. It also has the sequins. The China Poblana is covered in sequins. But these are, this particular costume was used in the Rose Parade, oh, about 10 years ago. And we also have another version, I'm gonna pull it out, is this one. Another version of the same basic costume. So there are many different variations that you can do as long as you're staying with the same basic design of the, of the dress. And below those, we have what is called a hoop slip. It's a short one because it goes only with that skirt. And something very important in that costuming is the bottom has to have picos. Now this one, luckily I found lace with that. This one is hand crocheted. And so if you can possibly find somebody to do crochet work for you, you can actually get it done. And in Mexico, they would be hand crocheted picos for, that would trim the slip. So just a few things. After I graduated from high school, I went to live in Mexico for a year to learn Spanish because I didn't grow up speaking it. And I really wanted to learn about it. And the family that I was living with, one of the sisters there was a folklorico teacher. So I would go to her studios after I'd get out of school and wait for her to finish teaching. And then we would go home. I'd sit and watch. Well, that was in 1969 that I got up to do some dance that I wasn't interested in, and I have not been able to stop since. I kept on, it's, it pulled something out of me, inside of me, that also made me feel good about my Mexican heritage, and it kept me going, and since then, I have been taking classes from teachers all over the country of Mexico. And so it was important to make sure that I represented them well, I represented them correctly, and I wanted those teachers to be proud of me, their student, to show that I was doing things correctly here. And it's important for me to show people here in the United States that Mexico has such a variety, so much beauty in their heritage and their dancing. So when you travel around Mexico, every single state has different music, different costuming, different style of dancing. And each country, each state, has such incredibly beautiful costuming. Here's another dress. This is from the state of Zacatecas. 
Here in, the, here in this part of California, we have a lot of people from, from Zacatecas, and this is one of the costumes that comes from that state. This is for some dances called Las Cuadrillas, which means square dances. We're familiar with those. It's in the northern state, Zacatecas, so there's a lot of influence from Europe for our square dancing here in the United States and these dances in Mexico. This has a slight tail to it. And then we have the shorter front. And so I'm very elegant looking. It's for Las Cuadrillas, the dances. Get nice state of Zacatecas. I have been teaching dance since I came back from Mexico. I lived there 68, 69. I came back and I started teaching dance as soon as I got back because as I was learning down there, I was also starting to learn how to teach. And so since then, I've kept on teaching. Uh, most of the years that I've been up here, I have been teaching at Plaza de la Raza, the Cultural Arts Center in Lincoln Park. And what I really enjoy about working with the kids is that you see a certain smile come over their faces when they learn the dance and they know it's part of their heritage. Here I have a blouse that is fashioned after the China Poblana blouse that I used to wear when I was a performer. Since we could not find the same style here and we needed eight of them, we decided to make our own. So I drew all the flowers on panels, on fabric, painted all of them, and then we found somebody that started to help us embroider them. They will eventually all be covered in embroidery. But for right now, we went to just painted blouses and made our own China Poblana blouses. Here we have some embroidered flowers, which all of them, as I said, will end up being completely embroidered. But from, a, from the stage and the audience, you can't tell that they're not embroidered. So dance really has become very therapeutic for me. It makes me feel good, it makes a child feel good, which what's more important than making a child feel good about themselves and help them develop into such, um, oh, I can't even think of a, uh, a word right now, have them develop into such a wonderful adult that's going to reflect on their children and going to reflect on the people around them. And so dance is such an important way to let go build self-confidence, uh, you feel good about yourself. You may walk into a class tired, but you'll come out with energy, and that helps. It helps them, it helps me. And so it's a win-win situation for all of us. next region we have another area that is from is the state of Colima. This is the dress that is used for the jarabes in Colima in the state. Now we use these colors because there's a particular candy called El Pajor that's one of the main products of the state of Colima and most of you are familiar with it. It's the coconut candy with the little reddish pink stripe on top. That's why we have pink and the pink tone and the white. The white is eyelid. I used eyelid because it reflects a little bit of, of light that looks like the sugar candy. So for me, instead of using just the plain white fabric, I used the eyelid because I like the, the effect it gave. It almost looks like you're sugary candy and it's the, the coconut candy with the little red strip on top, El Fajor. So that's where the color tones came from this and this was designed, it was created, the design of the dress is created by Rafael Samaripa from the University of Colima. Here another dress that we use is from the state of Sinaloa and the drawings from this I got from 
one of the teachers from the state of Sinaloa that worked at one of the conferences that we took classes at. Hand painted, and here all the girls had to paint their own dresses. I put them all to work. I create the style, I give them this, I made stencils for them so everybody would have the same flower and we painted. We spent a few hours at Plaza de la Raza in the art class, art room, painting dresses. So that's another fun thing. If, if you can't go to the state to actually buy a dress down there, then you find a way to make it up here. Earlier, we looked at the Veracruz Huasteco. Now we're going to the Veracruz Jarocho, the two styles of music and dance that they have in Veracruz. These are the dresses from Veracruz. It has the white skirt, very ornate. Some of them have more lace than others. You're free to do whatever you want on the dress, which is nice. So, and all of our girls have a different skirt. They're not all the same. Some groups like them all the same, and it looks beautiful on stage. But this way, when we get new dancers, they can bring in their own skirt. They just have to use the same style of apron and shawl. Now, most of my dancers that have been with me for some time, their apron is hand embroidered. This one is one that I use for my students, so it's the applique are put on. But there's a reason why the skirt's white, their blouse, their shawl is white, and the apron is black, because when they're out in the sun, if you're familiar with Veracruz, it's in the eastern side of, of Mexico, in the Gulf, and it's very hot and humid. You get a lot of sun. Sun reflecting off of white into your face is a little blinding. So the black apron stops the reflection from going into your face. This is probably one of my favorites. I love the brightness of the color. Combinations that I've put on this one. I was t told, and I've learned from one of my all-time favorite and best friends, Maestro Rafael Samaripa from the University of Colima, who was at one time with the University of Guadalajara. That's where I first started learning about costuming from him. He has shown me how to combine colors and how they're going to look on stage under stage lights, not only on outside with the sunlight. So it makes a big difference. Colors will, cer certain colors will change when you put it on stage. Some of the basic colors will change their tones. So when you're making these dresses, you have to be aware, how is this going to look? With stage lights hitting it, and outside in the direct sunlight. So that makes a big difference. And he has said that my costumes are very elegant, which makes me feel incredibly good. And here's a polka dress. So this is the style of dress. This is one of the styles. There are a number of different dresses you can use, different styles that you can use from Chihuahua. But if you're gonna wear the polka dress, you must have this in the back. It has to have the back almost like a tail with all the pleating and the lace on there. We saw earlier the Jalisco dresses with all the colors on the ribbons, on the ruffles. This is another style of a Jalisco. Same style, basically different colors, very soft looking. This dress I made specifically for a dance, and a song that was choreographed and written by Maestro Samaripa called Las Palomas. And to me, the white dress just looked very elegant, very old fashioned looking. And we have up here all the pleat work where the dresses from Jalisco, we used to do a lot of pleating in them. And the heavy ruffle 
The cameo I put on, it just kind of finished it. Instead of having necklaces, I wanted a very elegant look to it for Las Palomas and a little white headpiece for it. And so Jalisco, beautiful and heavy, very heavy. When the girls use these, trust me, it's uh, you need you work up your muscles. You're strong. You work up a lot of muscle. Another region is the state of Michoacan in Mexico. The blouse I was able to get from Michoacan, which is hand embroidered, Punta de Cruz, which is a very popular stitch in Mexico. Now with there, I went to Mexico to Colima to the university. I worked with the costume lady there at the university to learn how to make the proper skirt. And I'm gonna shift it over for you. The back of the skirt from Michoacan is pleated, very heavily pleated. So you get this little fan effect in the back. And so I learned how to make it over there. I came up, bought the fabric here, and I made four of these for my dancers. Now they have a particular type of headpiece. Their braid is a different style from most of the other ones that we see and with the long ribbons hanging. The belt to hold the skirt on is supposed to be a woven piece, but we didn't have that up here. So I luckily found trim and all my searching downtown, found trim able to make it look like it's woven from Mexico. Here's the type of apron. Now in Michoacan, they will be all hand embroidered aprons and there are a number of different styles you can use. But this is what you would call the gala, which means the, the party apron or the elegant apron that they would use. And this is all embroidered, but it's just different fabrics that I found at another place that I, that I went to outside of downtown LA, another store I happened to, have to come across and I found fabric that works for the apron, for the embroidery. from the state of Oaxaca, which has a number of different types of areas within Oaxaca. Within the state of Oaxaca, there are probably about 30 different regions. And each region is gonna have their own type of costume and uh, their own type of dance. This one is Jarabe Mixteco, one particular dance. It's just a lovely floral skirt, but notice right now, large print flowers. I'm going to show you a different skirt later with small print flowers. Here we have the braids that come from here. This goes behind the head, behind their, their basic bun, and it comes, it's worn down in front. This is an amazing, I love this actual braid because the, the ribbon is so long. So, look at all the colors. Oaxaca is a very very, very colorful state. Another part of Oaxaca comes from, oh, we, it's from uh, the southern part of Oaxaca. We have Tehuantepec down there. And these, this comes from another region in Oaxaca, and this is for a dance called Flor de Piña. Now, the huipiles from Flor de Piña are a certain style and it's hard to get them up here and I've been told recently you can't get them anymore. I have real ones that I have put away but sometimes we don't have enough of the real ones so we have to find ways to make something that looks like the real ones. This is another one that I made. The fab I found some fabric that looked embroidered, different colors, wasn't bright enough so I painted it. Why not? I got the colors in. Pink and turquoise are very popular colors, are color combinations in the state of Oaxaca. And so we have the huipil, and underneath both of these, there'll always be a skirt. Like this one, this one has beautiful cutouts. 
that is worn to elongate the huipil. The huipil will go usually below the knee, and then we have another skirt that will go down to the floor for that. This is a rather colorful one, but it's a simple dress with some old fashioned looking flowers. During the revolution, there were a lot of fabrics that had small flowers on them. And when you go to the northern part of Mexico, you'll notice that all the floral prints will be small flowers. This is for Revolucion. This is just called a ranchera. Short sleeves, wide neck with a ruffle, and this is what some the some the type of something the women would wear. Most usually during the revolution you would have more just maybe the blouse and skirt, just a plain blouse and with a floral print. Because many times flower sacks and such that flower came in, you would have small print on them. So that's where you would get a little bit more authentic looking fabric would be from a, from a sack of flour, which we're not using. We, we're lucky, we get to use all this modern, modern fabrics now. One of the most important things to me of Mexican women is their rebozo. I love rebozos. So since my first trip in 1968 to Mexico, I started collecting rebozos and I wear them everywhere. To me, you don't even need to wear jewelry. If you're going someplace elegant, wear something plain and toss on a rebozo. And to me, this, look at the colors, look at the work. Ah, let me back up. Look at the macrame work on here. This is by, by the way, this is my very first also that I bought in 1968, my first trip to Mexico City during the Olympics. But the elegance of the Brevoso, it used to be considered just for the poor women, but now the, the rich women in Mexico have realized the importance of it. It, this particular brevoso I bought in a museum. I could not get over the work, how they managed to do the greca, the pattern on the brevoso, and then the solid brown macrame. It's, it's amazing, and it's hard to find brevosos like this. I also have this tray that has a number of brevosos in it, which is probably about a third of my collection because every time I go to Mexico, I will not come home without buying a Revoso first. Love them. The elegance, the meaning that it has as a Mexican woman, you can wear one so proudly, and to me, it just makes me feel incredible. I love my heritage, and it's wonderful to be able to display it with a Revoso on. It's been so wonderful that I've been able to be a part of the faculty at Plaza de la Raza. I've been there for over 40 years. I think we're going, I'm going into 50 years there. But it's always been so wonderful to see the kids that have come through us and been able to go on to successful livelihoods. And Plaza just brings in, it's sacred ground for many of us. It brings in so many different students and the parents see what the children are learning and they value all of the things that they learn. Whether it be in dance, in art, theater, music, anything, the children develop self-confidence. They go on to become better human beings as far as I'm concerned. And it's, it's a wonderful family to be a part of. You can't get a better family than Plaza de la Raza. It, it, it really is spectacular. I hope you enjoyed visiting me in my studio as much as I enjoyed showing you my studio. Have a great day. We'll see you. Bye.